Welcome to the Brooklyn Rails Wednesday afternoon reading series. We have a uh, terrific reading for you today. The reading is called Dreamboat Hour. It is curated by Ali Warren, and Ali is going to be reading, as will Ari Banyas, Andrew Brooks, and Camille Roy. I will introduce Ali in just a second or in a minute. Um, but first, I just want to say a couple quick things about the series. Um, if you're here for the first time, or if you've been here before but forgot how this works, you can uh, pay attention to the chat and there'll be links posted to the various endeavors and activities and publications by our esteemed readers. This is the 143rd of these weekly readings, which happen every Wednesday. They're not going to happen next week or the week after because there's going to be a break uh, and there's going to be a, what I'm told is a um, a sci-fi movie series that taking place instead. So to a week from today, you can watch the first half of Starship Troopers. And then uh, the week after that, you can watch the second half of Dark Star, which is, uh, it surprisingly works to do that. This is also the 852nd episode of the Neutral Survival Emission series. And um, we're closing in on a thousand, I guess. And um, there's a new issue of the Brooklyn Rail just out, the July, August issue. And um, please check that out if you uh, want to take a look. And thank you all for being here. I'm going to introduce Ali who is going to read first and is hopefully going to read for more than two minutes, um, maybe at least five or six. Ali Warren is the author of Sundial from Neon, or is that Nyon Editions? Or is it, ne I don't know how to say that. I think it's Nyon. Nyon Editions. Little Hill, which is published by City Lights. I love it though from Nightboat and Here Come the Warm Jets also from City Lights as well as over 10 chapbooks. Winner of the Poetry Center Book Award and twice a finalist for the California Book Award of writing has appeared in many venues including Critical Quarterly, Feminist Formations, Harper's and Poetry. Ali has lived and worked in the Bay Area since 2005. Please welcome Ali Warren to the Rail Reading Series. Hey everyone. Uh, I'm excited to be reading for you. Uh, I'm going to read some new poems, which um, I hope that goes okay. I thought it was a good chance to sort of sound them out <clears throat> over the internet to you all. Um, and then I'm going to get out of the way and let us all enjoy um, Ari and Andrew and Camille. I'm so excited to hear you all. Um, there are a few quotes in the poems, and I feel like it sort of messes with the the music of it, um, or I haven't yet figured out how to say the person's name that the quote is from within the poems. So um, just know that if there's something that sounds really awesome, it's probably a quote. And I'll do like this thing, I guess. Um, okay. Um, so the first poem, uh, is titled with a line from um, Kevin Davies. I think therefore ascribing consciousness to ourselves a form of anthropomorphism. The thing about worth is for whom. This one wants it brackish. This one wants it fresh. First it was black, now it's blue. A trough but deeper, a bow but wider. I've got ears to hear what? Wallowing in my own duff, scanning the sky's barcode. Then freelance warriors show up. They charter the joint stock and gobble up freeholds, snuff dipping in the presence of everyone. Not excessive, but routine, 
not accidental, but widespread, followed by more expeditions, followed by more expeditions. You get the land grant if you import the people. And so Ben Franklin gets to name the current. <clears throat> Red-breasted 501c3. They put a bee in a straight jacket and turn off the protein. They bleed you and say it brings you to your senses. A flag falls open and out comes rot. It fits over an adult's head, though it's difficult to look through the openings. It's free, but there's no time to enjoy it. All the waters are too acidic and there's no oxygen around. It must be physically dug out by someone cheap, skilled, and mobile. They sound as if they mean what they say, compounding what they comport to solve. Some through treaties and some through the breaking of treaties. And so I started to dig. And so I began digging, dragging my knuckles around, dragging my knuckles aground. <clears throat> 8,000 things that can kill you. The slowing jet stream, a date with no pit, little yelps from the waiting room, box stores for neighborhoods that don't exist, the lonely clerk thanking me profusely for nothing, a hyper-realistic deep fake, tofu litter, 80 March degrees, an infinite number of ways to die, a reconstructed Neanderthal ear, being driven mad as a consequence of love, being driven mad by fear of arbitrary interference. Lucretia says seeds are fixed, and out of what does ether feed the stars? A hem of slime, a movement as slight as no movement at all. It's funny to write like short little poems again after having a, a period where I was writing like longer lined things, I don't know. Um, okay. Um, the sod we look upon. <clears throat> On the edge of the continent, I show up head to toe in slop. A man on the radio says guff. Turkey feather in the compost, turkey feather in the street. John tells me my hair looks Roman. St. Paul sinks one from downtown. I rush outside at the quarter break to get some of the longest light of the year. I close my eyes and try to hear the music of the planets in their orbits. My hand butts the sticky pistol of a calla lily. Everything is made of the same stuff. Flooding washes away borders and bees love borage, where streams have different courses. Every knoll has a name. Abundant spurts. Every morning, the magnolia broadens its eye over the whole quad, abiding in bright unison, bright because syncopated, lodged in what timetables of profit don't account for, in the interstices of labor where the air and light gets in, a succession of swells where rabbits grow like ground cover. The Easter lilies are here, but it's nowhere near Easter. To the corms and cormlets. Cedar says we find a world we name to live in through writing and then a form for its dispersal. Oozing roots and resin, a mess of welts, mush and cakes, some wood, some coal, some sod and dung. When the pampas grass turns rose colored, greet the newly sprung sunflower. Guard the mysteries and unspool the cesspool. When it reeks, from 10 feet away, take down the melon.
Antonietta keeps her garlic in the freezer. For a woman to just sit around and think, making the work in a context for the work in the same gesture. That's Camille Roy. Flowering lamb's ear, poplar at its seasonal peak, oleander finely tall enough to glean morning shadow. The water flows in, around, and through the subsoil, the air, and the surface. So why don't we fall off? Did I misunderstand what I saw? Do I misunderstand what I see? A breeze blows through, little clods, more light, a coherent being. I've had good sense since. And this last poem takes its title from a line from Camille as well. Mm. There are many roads into the succulent interior. Where the land is ripped to ribbons, we make a holiday in the oak meadow mosaic. Two trees snap and thus into the fire, we age and floss and bed down. The painted ladies come at each elbow from the basins to the fit hills. We are members of each other. May our dust on the California crust fall where it may a small dirt farm, a two-faced flower. That's it. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ali. The sleepless brain produces amazing things. Uh, <laughs> thank you also for bringing everybody together today. Our next reader is going to be Andrew Brooks. Andrew lives on unceded Wangal land in Sydney, Australia. It's either really early or really late uh, where Andrew's at, so uh, extra applause is, might be necessary. He's a lecturer in the School of Arts and Media at the University of NSW, a co-editor of Rosa Press with Astrid Larange. He is one half of the critical art collective Snack Syndicate, and he is the author of Homework from Discipline Books, published in 2021, a book of essays in art and politics co-authored with Larange and also the author of the poetry collection Inferno, published by Rosa also uh, in 2021. Please welcome Andrew Brooks to the Rail Reading Series. Uh, thanks so much. Um, thanks so much, Ali, uh, for the invitation. Um, it is, I'm going to say really early because um, I went to bed and now I'm awake. Um, <laughs> and a wild time to do a reading. Um, but I'm excited and uh, yeah, it's yeah, I've never done a reading at 3 a.m. So here we go. Um, and it's so, you know, what a joy to wake up and um hear Ali Warren read some poems. And I'm also very excited to um be able to listen to Ari and Camille. So thank you for this wonderful invitation. It's really delightful to be here. Um, I'm gonna read um some new poems. Um from a project I'm working on that's a kind of um, long poem in 37 parts. It also features, um, each of the sections features a quote. So again, like in Ali's, except I mean, all of Ali's lines are beautiful, but here really the best lines are definitely written by people. Um, yeah, so I'm going to read a few sections of this and then I'll see how I'm going and um, maybe I'll read something, old, but we will see. Uh, the poem is called The Year of the Ox. Today is the ninth day of winter, my least, my least favorite season, even though the light is special and hot showers are pretty great. Lentil stew with tahini and feta and toasted seeds is also excellent. I wore two pairs of socks and my feet felt trapped. Even though I know it's gauche to complain about the weather, I do it anyway. But this poem doesn't care about the weather. 
This poem cares about blackberries, which are sour and delicious, and garden spiders who weave del delicate webs, and broccoli pasta with pickled chilies and parsley, and the song Brimful of Asher, Fatboy Slim Remix playing on the stereo, which is to say it cares about what is good, as narrated by Arvind Rosa. I was born in the year of the ox, a beast with broad back and generous spirit who carried the rat and everything that critter carried, like gossip and dreams and perversions, like handfuls of toasted almonds across the line. Before I was born, the last time it was the year of the ox was 1973, which gave us crocodile rock and the first global oil crisis, which also marks the beginning of the end of US hegemony even as some got high, huffing the fumes of circulation as if they were huffing tulips in bloom. Crocodile Rock is a terrible song that is perfect as a harbinger of doom. Later that year, Sly and the Family Stone would release If You Want Me To Stay, a song that feels so good you wish you could live inside it, and you can, if only for a moment. The alchemy of the three-minute song is that it's a container for all that is uncontainable like clouds, big ones. Oh, it's blowing up wild outside. Two tides, crocodile rock, and if you want me to stay, is this what they mean by the dialectic? I woke to drink copio, kosong, which is Bahasa Malayu for black coffee with no sugar. The coffee is thick and rich and sludgy, and I like it best when it's brewed with chicory root, earthy and bitter and slightly sour. Or I walk to a poem that whistles a promise like all good poems do. Let him enter this small store when the moon shimmers in the blue window panes. Let him pinch before our eyes tins of chicory. But the magic ingredient in copio is not theft nor chicory, but margarine that glistening mound of electric yellow developed to keep the French working class alive just long enough to die on the front lines and factory floors while the emperor's small son was photographed atop a horse and made into a 19th century bourgeoisie basketball card. In its original form, the luster was beef cello turned with milk to make a drab gray substance. The myth of haute cuisine is a tale of cultural imperialism. Palm oil came to replace beef tallow in the food of the working poor, just as the African palm, disciplined into neat little rows, came to replace rubber trees in the plantations of Southeast Asia. The organization of nature returned to the descendant of indentured coolies in a cup of thick black caffeinated mob that promises to stave off fatigue but will only amplify it. An appetite that knows no nourishment, like the Ouroboros or a haze that never lifts. At some point, Big Butter would try to turn the emerging classes against the emerging middle classes against the immiserated. Things have come to a strange pass when the steer competes with the cow as a butter maker. We ought, we ought not now to desert her or allow her to be displaced. Her sweet and wholesome products are planted by an artificial compound of grease that may be chemically pure but has never known the fragrance of clover. But some have known the fragrance of the oil palm, which in Tamil is known as Kapha Tharu, celestial tree. And in its scent, we remember that our future is predicated on the abolition of town and country, north and south. Last night, I dreamed I could remember my dreams. I was a poet by the name of Janet Jackson who wore a long skin tight latex dress made from the milky white goo harvested from the palakum guda tree, which once upon a time was extracted to insulate telegraphic cables that rested upon the ocean floor. Janet could recall all of her dreams, which she translated into a song. Gonna make, gonna make, gonna make your body wet. Gonna make, gonna make, gonna make your body scream out yes. Gonna make, gonna make you think of naughty things like me on you and you on me, what's it gonna be? In my dream, the reader of the poem tells me I should better myself, but Janet has no interest in self-improvement, can smell a cough even when dressed as a reader, and so sets fire to the page and sings, gonna make, gonna make, gonna make your body cream, 
going to make you have wet dreams. The flames echo and re-echo against each other and now crush forms. Deliciously sweaty bodies echo and re-echo against each other. The smell of salt and the taste of ash hangs in the air and cups of wine are passed among the crowd who suddenly fall quiet, just as Janet clears her throat in order to ventriloquize these words. The masses are in reality their own leader, dialectically creating their own development procedure. Now the reader of the poem suggests I ought to get back to work. And I feel a kind of dull ache in my jaw, the kind you have when you spend the night grinding your teeth about something you no longer recall. And so I sink into sleep again. Come in, it's open. A tone, long and luscious, is ours for the making. Or better still, is ours to give away. The commune's a place where officials will vanish, a place where song and verse will abound. No bullshit jobs, the earthy smell of turmeric in the air, a viscous liquid running over two hands, or two or more sets of hands. The band was cooking before we got there, and a couple passed an egg yolk delicately from mouth to mouth, and it turned us on. Come in, it's open. There's enough room for a pack. There's enough room for a pack of dogs or a nest of rats, or perhaps the architecture will simply fall apart if we remember it was never ours to give away, but always already given. In the early evening, I like to drink Campari on ice, listen to the sound of the ice cracking under the force of the bittersweet red liquid and the voices of strangers who read the poems of Elena Gomez and Ali Warren. Every choir needs somewhere to rehearse. Tune an ear to a whistle that exceeds its song. There's no score, but there's always singing. And at night, a little tipsy, it sounds so sweet, especially if the wind is blowing on shore. Is practice how we renew our habits and lift the spell? Come in, it's open. This next one is a Fast and the Furious poem. I don't know. Vin Diesel knew that in two, that 2009 began in 1973. A reprisal, 1873, 1748, 1557. Cycles of circulation you don't even realize. You're in a vicious circle. Los Bandoleros is an overlooked entry in the Fast and the Furious franchise, a short film written by Vin Diesel set in the Dominican Republic, the world in the grip of an oil shock. When the price of gas goes up, everything goes up. Bread, rice, milk. The year of the ox is the year of crisis. Paper over the cracks with a tempo that displaces space or the fumes of a pipe man with everything to lose. Diesel narrates our pasts and futures. Nanterre, Port-au-Prince, Minneapolis, Quito, Tehran. Watch as the price of a ride climbs, then watch the subway burn in Santiago, Chile. A ring road to nowhere or circulation all the way down and misery all the way up. Los Bandoleros means the bandits. In the film, Vin and his comrade stage a jailbreak, become fugitives, plan an oil tanker heist, drive fast. And this is the last from this new set of poems that I'll read. Suppose the poem had to pick sides. Suppose it gave up on metaphor, looked back from all that waste. Suppose the poem never had a plan, could never have a plan, could only exist between two shores, here and there, terror and infinity. Or suppose the poem began before the needle ever moved, the frequencies jostle, one ear the sound of love, the other, everything but, and for the heart, ungrammatical. Suppose our tactics became their tactics. Suppose their mouths made the shape of our words. Suppose, suppose the task was to, to derange the senses, but what if they took this on too? They say machines are dreaming now, but all their dreams are replications of misery and the cops still murder people for stupid shit, like value and pure pigment. Suppose poetry encountered its own fragility and responded, get those words out of your mouth and into your heart. 
Suppose that between two shores, we suddenly heard the noise that makes the silence. Supposed against them also meant against us, not in the ways that liberals and fascists say it, but in the way that inertia is broken by social life in the street or slow moving pleasures. Suppose the promise of derangement is not in hanging on, but giving up a flicker, a gift. We is an intimate pronoun which shifts its context almost as, as the eye blinks at it. Thanks. Um, I don't know, is that, I, I feel like that's probably good for time, yeah? Okay, thanks. <laughs> thanks so much. Um, it was really lovely to be here. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, that was fabulous. And uh, I have to tell you that there used to be a bar around here in New York City that I went to only because the jukebox had, if you want me to stay on it. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Thanks so much uh, for for waking up and reading to us. Um, next, we're going to hear from Ari Banyas. Ari is the author of Asymmetry, which won the 2022 Publishing Triangle Award for Trans and Gender Variant Literature, and also the author of Anybody, uh, both from W.W. Norton. His work has been supported by numerous fellowships and residencies and has been published in Triple Canopy, The Nation, The New Republic, Hyperallergic, The Yale Review, and Bayist, among others. Ari lives in Chicago. Please welcome Ari to the Rail Reading Series. Thank you, Anselm, and um, it's really nice to be here with all of you. Um, Thanks to Ali for curating this and inviting me, um, and um, to my co-readers, Ali and Andrew Kumbo. <clears throat> um, I'm gonna start out with a translation. Um, it is um, from a book that I'm working on translating, which I've been working on for a number of years um, by the Greek poet, Jenny Mastoraki. Um, it was written in, or it was published in 1972 um, at a time when Greece was under a military junta, a right-wing uh, dictatorship. Um, so that's kind of in, it's in all of the poems. Um, I'm just going to read one, one poem. Um, the book is called Viovia in Greek, which I translate as toll. Decline. Decline has no time constraints. It comes like an unofficial summons, and just like that, drags your furniture into the road. Around you, the children scrutinize the back of your chair, where in adolescent fury you had written, lies, lies, lies. Finally, you load just the bedroll onto a passing motorcycle and relocate to an unknown address. Um, I'm so glad that um, Ali and um, Andrew both read new poems. Um, so I'm gonna do the same, and your um, your doing so gives me the courage to do so. <laughs> Thank you. Um, they're all very new. <clears throat> the table or your ancestor. On our table, there was always, as they say, food. On the tables of my ancestors, food, more or less. Whatever they had, they shared. With the poet's wife, who comes down from the mountain afternoons while the poet lay in hiding with comrades. In the shade of the bookshop awning, she and my ancestor sit, gossiping. At the door each morning, the neighborhood listens as the baby without milk survived the night. They say all tables are contained within this one table, that the one you see 
you touch exists in your mind is particles perpetually in motion. The table is not, was never solid. That's fine. The one I'm sitting at, cherry, in a sort of Danish style, held together with exposed brass screws you built with Carl's dad in the early 70s, while back home they were under military rule. When it wobbles too much, I kick the legs out a little, so they splay in a way that helps it feel more stable for a time. I wish your table were real, but I can enjoy the illusion and touch it too. You're dead. Did you think I was gonna end there? For a second I did, then didn't. I'll end at some future time and place that already exists within this one, like a secret language hiding all along inside an official one. I'll end here. The pink's gone. It isn't sorrow makes me cold. I pour boiling water over relaxed mind at a firm squeeze of thyme honey from the label says some unspecified mountain in Greece. Bring forth the oracle coursing its woody sap juiced in bees drool and of service in my cup. All kinds of tortured dairy on my grocery, grocery list and bunched greens harvested in Cali by workers screwed so I might get less cancer or cancer later. Implicit, I, with buying power, decide that's worth it, it's sick, and probably that will give me cancer, the implicit. And anyway, why is it give? It feels assigned to each our cancer later or sooner and inexcusable. A pink band of sunset on the metallic top lip of the building across the alley shabby building, pretty light, perfection. Like altogether any body's unduplicatable amalgam of event, a gritty composite mostly swept to our outmost edges where sometimes pain's sweet. I pinch in a vice together a fat strand of silver with a fat strand of brass and twist their knot opposites. Compliments, cool, warm, buttery, brittle, how my bratty, soft, heart feels, stretched and folded, unfixed. Meanwhile, relaxed minds still too hot to sip. Instead, I bend toward its steam, sink into my own cold toes. Is that aliveness quite? What if fucking makes one feel more dead than not fucking for months, too racked with grief to? What if I'd gush torrents of passe sorrow and ribbons of cum for the ages, nothing to reservoir it without vessel to float out of this current agitated state I fidget into sobriety and it's naked, the accounting. I didn't call B though promised I would. I spoke harshly to you. S said, Two goats walk toward each other on the narrow tree trunk across the chasm, each wanting to cross first, unyielding, and so tumble to their deaths. I'm somehow both goats, I think, in this fable, headbutting on the brink. I haven't asked yet where the metal originates. I can't take any more bad news today, maybe tomorrow. Sorrow won't abate, but its temp is sure to change. A said, I like that you're cool with intensity, and they laughed, of course. Imagine utterly closed in, singing instead when we want to die. When my dad did, Father C chanted, your servant, Condoleez, who has gone to sleep. Sleep? He's not dreaming, not thinking, not getting up to piss at 2 a.m. into the plastic bedside urinal shaped, we decided, like a duck. He's never waking up, face spread with stage makeup and light mauve lipstick meant to mimic living flesh in a mid-range casket lowered into weatherproof vault. The pink's gone. Only the aluminum foil a neighbor, a neighbor carefully plastered over each of their alley facing windows reflects a light now wrinkled, exacting and sorry, cold. In Athens, 
The ancient road didn't speak to me, not directly. It has gone to sleep. I stroked its ruts, reddish stone where carts were grooves through the drama of repeated use. Language is like that too, is, is, is a tired being. The bent tree fans down in the other neighbor's yard where a bicolor dog treads back and forth through packed mud, repeated use, but no one's historicized it yet. This the neighbor who, while I hauled up the ugly wingback chair for dad to be comfortable in, purple of all things, honked at me to move my car now so neighbor could park his sooner. I yelled back, he could wait. My father's dying, I said. He said, yeah, well, we're all dying. You're dying too. Now I stare down his muddy yard, his well-preserved house with furniture scrunched onto its back porch, brown upholstered black plastic on casters. We're all dying. Two window box planters, one empty, one brimming last year's voided dirt, and a little metal gate within the yard, angled open, fencing off anything from grass, eaten concrete walkway, dry leaves, colorless tree. The motion triggered floodlights that peer onto a patio set, stripped down to its mat iron with pathetic curly cues. In my hands, I twist together warmed silver and brass, twined ring for the finger, for the cock bathed gently once more with a damp washcloth, a ring to last the centuries, or to puddle molten at the final flame whenever. Is mine relaxed yet? Soon? All your things, things. Labor, semi-precious hardness, the slip of loss tricked down into grass. Crabgrass, if it caught you at a certain angle, could slice. The unbearably soft sound of all that soil sliding off the truck bed, reaching earth. Livid gut feelings folded over, their hasty mass licked flap to seal. It is certified. The time of extractive friendship come to its ends, cut off in the countryside at last, my ecstatic planned obsolescence. Low subterranean hum gathering you down, a tone's undertone, have a seat. Let me tell you of the deep grief of, will you tell me, of a voice in a passing car, the blur of song come into focus briefly then driven off, a dog's yelp out there. Blue, 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 light blue, sun's sheen on window screen. Deep, I dug into the earth with my hands to plant rosemary for you. Love of being alive's sting. A small padded cooler with stitching coming undone, filled with your stopped watches I cannot part with. Ourselves in the rug's fuzz, proliferate and terminal. Your little silver hairs clinging to the electric razor's internal chamber, etc. Dirt layer adhered to sweat layer on the backs of my hands and the crease of my wrists. I tunneled down at the poisoned city limits. The brutal self-interested options await. A more or less sequined salt lick for one and a person you are supposed to push before they push you off the side of a cliff, so you're the one who lives. So you're the one who lives, you go off the cliff, leaving behind no more elegant sentences, forcing peril into the shape of an intelligence to be admired. A spoon on the edge of your plate, your last mouthful's imprint trembling there until it settles. All, all, all your things, and all your things things. And I'm gonna read one more poem um, from my book, my most recent book, Asymmetry. Waste. A piece of pleated gold wrapping from a poinsettia in yesterday's downpour caught and rode the gushing current downhill. It stalled between curb and parked cars, followed by an ebullient orange bounding through the gray. Free, the orange exit, the narrative. 
we have more work to do. This morning, the gold thing still hanging around next to a parked car, like a big empty flower or a loud hat, lightly stirring, not pinned. I remember two ladies from St. Margaret Mary carrying wilted poinsettias to the trash on a windy day. The gold is joined by a purple ball of tissue resembling one of those horrible plastic shower poops. Our purpose is not what they told us our purpose is. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ari. Um, gosh, I never say gosh, but I had to say it. And I, I, a symmetry must have just come out, right? That, that published, that's published this year. Um, actually, 2021, um, but it just came out in paperback. Okay. Let's well, that, <laughs> cool. Um, our final reader is going to be Camille Roy. Camille's a writer of fiction, poetry, and plays. Her fiction collection, Honey Mine, was published by Nightboat Books in 2021. Previous books include Sherwood Forest, a book of poetry and prose from Future Poem, and Cheap Speech, a play from Leroy Chatbooks, as well as Swarm, fiction from Black Stars series. She co-edited Biting the Error, Writers Explore Narrative, which was published by Coach House in 2005 and reissued in 2010. And that's a book of essays by writers on their own experimental prose practices. Earlier books include The Rosie Medallions, Poetry and Prose from Kelsey Street, and Cold Heaven, plays from Leslie Scalapino's O Books. Recent work has been published in Field Notes Number 4 in the UK, Amer Arcana, and Open Space, the uh, SF MoMA blog. Please welcome Camille Roy to the reading series. And thank you, Camille, for being here. Thank you all for being here. Hi, everybody. <laughs> it might be a little hoarse. Um, Ali, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really excited to read with you and Ari and Wendy. And, um, Thanks to everybody at the Brooklyn Room for this great series. Um, I'm gonna read, uh, I've been writing, my poems have been um, pulled from journal entries. The first series I'm gonna read is actually, uh, it's the longer one. And um, it is from a journal I wrote 30 years ago. And um, I'm thinking of it as a manuscript, like about, uh, a failed playwright. So it actually has some narrative, but it's also chaotic and just full of daily life. And the titles are all page numbers. Um, and then I'm going to um, read a few uh, like dated by date from, that are, are recent, that are quite recent. And that'll be short. Um, So, so the name of this section is 33. That's how old I was when I wrote it. And uh, so it starts seven. Oh, and the other thing is I turned all the people into, or I turned all, most of the people into animals. Um, the elephant is so depressed. He's at a wall, still obsessed over his ex. Even his therapist has backed off for now. We meet for lunch, something about my play. Really, it's my catastrophic need for reassurance. He looks at me and blinks all weariness. No joy is stuck like a thumbtack to the flat area just above his trunk. 14, relic, an urge to fuck only last night, then swinging like a corpse. I want my writing to sting the dead, therefore, I allowed the publicity photographs. This helped my stalker figure out where I was. He sent me a poster with my transgressions listed in a large scrawl. Under that was another list suggestively worded, but the actual punishments were left blank. Today, 
the gray suits advanced on my desk like spies from Mission Impossible. The ones with the most power were particularly oblique. The boss of them all was a woman. And from that crowd, seemingly a ghost, because so disembodied, came the voice of Tim, today a gopher, and bubbly bright, which is his usual. I imagine his burrow, old, big, and full of pups, somewhere in Illinois. 19, some sort of girl deserves that spot, hollow with her desires and shining as a dime on the sidewalk. Fist held up, it looks like a dried apple. Startled antique mouth, that's the father. Girl can dress it, but not a dressing. She's the marble in my cup, whereas I'm the you she named. Put out like stray cats. What happens when we're bored with pain? 26. A singular terrible occurrence is always approaching. What is between the parents is silence. The child must derive an interpretation to drive herself from their awful interlock. Then the writer returns to familiar thoughts. Opal, ruby, Formaline, opal, carnelian. Can she make their struggles articulate? Of course not. Thoughts are uncollectible like debts. Angrily, she looks for subject to twist and fuck with, like a play under the skin of the air. As description drains away, potentiality is more vivid. Dream. A woman, played by Jamie Lee Curtis, is blindfolded and strapped to a chair by her husband because why? I don't know. She screams for him while he calmly watches, unseen by her. Eventually, he lights the ropes. She is incinerated. As from below, we see her vagina burn. It is glowing red, and the opening is shaped like a peach pit. 43. The writer gets to meet Robin, supposedly a good poet, yet anything she tries longer than a paragraph turns into a blog. Plus, a body so hot it creates a mess. Fatigue of excess, it's exhausting. Even worse is her personality. My honest opinion, for a pussy lover, Robin has too many likes and dislikes, not enough enthusiasms. The wife says, I don't like these snot-faced middle-class whiners. 51, witness thingness, pretty. Saw S and it was almost good. She showed me her tiny egg. I'm still intimidated, but otherwise, Peering outside my husk of feeling, I can see everything is beautiful. 63, I meet Lou as he glues clouds to the back wall. These are for the writer's play. Lou's body empties itself into his edges as he confesses he has become a rodent. It happens when the night is dead, in the dead of night. Is this a dream? No, he says. Truly, there is materiality to deal with. Sleepless, he swims in the depths of melancholy, a little mouse that squeaks and paddles. I watch his set accumulate and listen with my girlish ears. Why mouseness? He had twin uncles, he explains. One was evil. After trauma treatment completes, recovery is expected. Loose face hangs sweet and blank over the painted sky, a moon on the ladder, as the stories rise in glittering piles. Lou's father died in his arms, heart shuddering. Lou felt his spirit pass through his chest, even as his mother sobbed. We made love just last night. How beautiful it was. 65. 
Swish tail. Funny story. Tim's new trick lives in the burbs with wife and kids. Repairs police radios for a living. Trick took Tim to the foxy lady to buy him a garter belt and fishnet stockings. Later, Tim tells me, by the things he wanted, I know he wanted man sex. Coyote howls. The trick is not getting caught. 74. The queer as fruit fly. Open your skin. The meat is dead but tasty. Be my scalpel bride. 77. Give it a fertile chop or a big map, as if stab runs with purple, as if the child bred, such as the love dot with hills. Opening night is a narcissistic crisis. It's the doorbell. It's that story told without light for the first time. 79. Slinking into the world premiere, the writer sinks into the mud of her community spirit, while the wife wears what the writer can't vocalize, a fox she strangled with a fork. After the curtain thrust in the limelight, gripping a pink bouquet, the writer's just an ounce under a pond. She'll wind up eaten by the mongrel self. Back home in lackadaisical mode, she reads Dennis's latest, then finds herself swarming out from under her rock as though she was Satanist. But she's not. She prefers things that are cooler, wetter. Your heart is in my wallet, she gasps as the writer languishes in her wife's cold breath. Dream. Black pelts came out of my sides near my hip bones. They were so long, I clipped them. By stroking each one, I discovered the right was thicker than the left. They were somehow associated with all my other hands, my colonies of men. Then the dream shifted. The wife and I were fucking on the floor of the bathroom. Wow, the rug was so soft and thick. I was panting when I woke up. Then I had this thought, a play is a leap into the body. 100, Alice not reading tonight. I wondered about her fatigue. It was so faint, such an elusive emanation that it felt like an actual illusion. Did it grip her or did she hold it? Her reading was fantastic. Beckett is a dramatist of the poetic situation. His situations are incredible. 101, I'm crushed emeralds, green snow, powder before spring. I'm year, a god girl in wet and yellow. What good is this girl? Vanquished, she eats air and holds the ear of a girlish. She's the density of clay. In a purple skirt, she walks and stops and walks, sandals and Joshua. She sits through the reading behind Carla, who wakes her up with the sound of eyelids lifting and dropping, a perfect sound. I want something like your bones, Carla, as a companion, walking without strain into the disassociated void. 121. At the opening, Phyllis hissed in my ear twice. I'm so proud of you. Carla was there, my spiritual leader. So what's my next plan? I imagine a drag queen alcoholic who is beset by hallucinations, which pull him further and further into insanity until he collapses. Then he is dragged in circles and luxury to by vaguely Catholic medical attendants. He absorbs these lessons, but vengefully, so that the result is a dazzling eruption of more and more queenliness. Joan of Dark is born, and her shed skins become other queens, each one more massive and glittering than the rest. An army of queens, Joan of Dark at the head. Joan is heard to say, in the Christian ending, we spark and reach our brightness. 
Yesterday, all my troubles seemed so far away. Today, the girls from the hills came down. This time they brought a load of pink rubies, pink and small, not red. That means low quality. Nonetheless, spread across the table, they were very pretty. I was promised a small handful, but then Dee swept them up with her hand and said they would arrive later. What's fucked is I transform the pressure of the unsaid into something I've done wrong. Okay, so that's 30 years ago. So this is May 30th. These are just short, these are like question calls. May 30th, lying on the bed with Kat while watching dark violet evening sky. Violetting, a verb that allows us to measure amounts of violet. What is the difference between gesture and this sparkling soupy presence? My lips, gelatinous, flavor my soup. Does nature suffer? Or is it all a sequence of strange food producing events punctuated by the grief of animals? June 5th, these are just weird questions. <laughs> Why are all clouds like foreheads? This morning they are lying on the ground and weeping. Thus, I cannot see down the hill. What is this parallel between yourself and your corpse? Your voice has dropped into the past like a stone into a lake. I'm waiting for the future to turn around and come back. June 6th. It's evening, but it feels midday. Over the greenish haze and beyond the water are the etched gray silhouettes of the far hills. This light extinguishes me. In the garden, every moment brushes death. Through slow rottenness, each thing turns into a grave. Meanwhile, the green water oscillates with the gray water. We know this because we vote. The logic of before and after creates many small acts of decomposition. Thanks. Well, shit, God damn, thank you. Thanks everybody. Camille, uh, you know what? After this reading, I feel like everybody should just have permission to take the rest of the day off. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much, Ali and Ari and Andrew and Camille. Uh, this is wonderful. It's great fucking summer reading or re it would be good any season but sorry i'm just babbling um well we are in fact taking the next two weeks off i was lying about the starship troopers dark star thing but i feel like i should be allowed to lie in public once in a while since everybody else who speaks in public lies all the time but you know you could watch the first hour <laughs> anyway um hey thanks all all of y'all for being here and thanks so much for the amazing readings and now we'll do the thing where we throw the mics open so we can say hi and goodbye on the way out uh and go off into uh the rest of the universe with all these words thank you so much thank you so much thank you, thank you. Thank you so much this this is amazing. Readings today. Thank, thank you. you thank you that was so inspiring yeah. So Thank you. Thanks, y'all. Have a lovely afternoon, everyone. Hi, Thank you for the beautiful reading. <laughs> Thank, Thank you so much. Beautiful. Thank See you in a couple Thank weeks. You. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a great afternoon. Bye. Bye. Bye.